The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Festool. Faster, easier, smarter. And by Powermatic. The gold standard since 1921. Trying to make a water-based finish look more like an oil-based finish? I think we can. So, water-based finishes. They're pretty easy to apply. They're better for the environment. They don't really have as much of a noxious odor to them. They dry pretty quickly and they're fairly protective. So, what's not to love? Well, the thing is, one of the properties of water-based finishes uh, that can be an added benefit at certain, at certain points, depending on the wood that you're using, um, can also be its biggest drawback. And that's the fact that it doesn't yellow over time. There's a term called water white, which means when you apply this over something like a nice piece of maple, that maple will look that natural, light, bleach blonde color throughout its life. It's not going to yellow over time like an oil-based finish. Uh, but because of that, the water-based finishes really don't impart any amber hues at all, any of that nice yellow orange tone that we're used to seeing in an oil-based finish. And I think what's happened is, since that's just the traditional material that we've used over the years, people really expect that to be on a piece of wood. So when we see a water-based finish go on, it might be a little disappointing. It looks a little cold. It doesn't look uh, quite as elegant as we think it should. Uh, you know, compared to using oil-based. So, a lot of the questions that I get uh, from viewers of the show refer to exactly that. How can we still use water-based but make it look like it's an oil-based finish? How do we bring that life back into the wood even if the top coat doesn't impart a whole lot of color? And I think we've got a few good options here. Now, there are three pretty common ways that you can go about uh, bringing this extra life to that water-based finish. And they're all based on the same principle, and that is putting some color into the wood first before we add our top coat. We're not really going to do anything with the top coat itself, although you could. Uh, that's probably a fourth method that you can use. But these are the three uh, that I find to be the easiest, the most accessible, um, and the most likely for you to have some success with. Uh, so let's take a look at each individual one. Uh, before we do that, I just want to mention we will have, like any good experiment should, controls. I have one board here that I have from a previous um, practice uh, piece that I had made that's coated with um, General Finishes semi-gloss. Okay, that's going to be our oil control. And then I've got another board which I haven't coated yet, but that's going to receive the uh, General Finishes polyacrylic semi-gloss. This is also going to be the water-based material that's going to top coat these other three experimental boards. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, three different methods individually. Now the first option we're going to look at is the application of an oil. And we're not talking an oil-based varnish here, we're just talking oil. Um, boiled linseed oil, in fact, is a relatively pure oil, but it's had uh, chemical dryers added to it that helps it cure. Now you can use something like uh, a pure tongue oil, uh, but tongue oil has a little bit more of a reputation for not yellowing quite as much over time. And that's actually something that we really want in this case. So I'm just going to stick with the boiled linseed oil, plus it's cheaper. Okay, so to apply it to the surface, pretty straightforward. I'm just going to flood it on, let it soak in. So after about five minutes, I'm going to wipe off the excess, and I'm going to monitor the piece of wood for the next, uh, I don't know, eight to ten hours, just check it every once in a while make sure no oil is seeping up to the surface because that can happen in some uh, open poured woods and things like oak have a tendency to do that. Just get a paper towel and wipe off the excess. Now, what I'm going to do, see boiled linseed oil takes a long time to cure and especially if you're going to coat it with a water-based finish, obviously oil and water don't mix so it needs to be completely cured before you even think about trying to put a water-based finish on it. But there is one option that we can, uh, we can do to sort of speed up the process a little bit. You know how we always talk about shellac being a universal binder? Um, this is a perfect example of that. If I wait about three to four days, you want to be extra cautious, wait about a week, and then I apply a nice light coat of shellac, de-waxed shellac, onto the surface, then I can safely apply my water-based top coat. So that's exactly what we're going to do with this piece. All right, so here is our boiled linseed oil board, nice and dry. And I'm going to coat it with some shellac. And again, I'm just using the bullseye seal coat, two pound cut, clear, de-wax shellac. Not going to need very much here. And remember, very quick and deliberate motions when you're using the shellac. And 
That's it. Let that dry probably for a good hour or two. Now our next option is to use a water-based dye um, or multiple dyes to get the color that we're after. I've got some general finishes, uh, light brown dye stain and amber dye stain, both water-based. And I'm going to do a little bit of a mixture here that's going to make, it's actually going to be a pretty dilute mixture to impart that color. I really don't want to completely dye the surface. I just want to add a hint of color. Now, just to be uh, sure that we're doing everything the right way here, if I could um, quickly review. Water-based finishes, anything water-based on this surface is going to raise the grain. Okay, and that means that once it dries, the grain is going to stick up. And if you have color and dye in there, you can't exactly sand it because then you're going to start sanding out the color as well. So what I like to do is after I've done my final sanding, 180 grit usually with the grain, I give it a little spray with water, spread it around with a paper towel. You want to make sure, you want to make sure everything is covered because you want it all to raise. Okay, this technique is known as pre-raising the grain. Okay, and let that dry for about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Give it one final sanding with 180 grit again, and this will drastically reduce the amount of uh, raised grain that we get once we add our dyes to the wood. Now, this is definitely not an exact science with this mixture. Depending on the brand dye that you use, the colors you pick, uh, it can vary pretty dramatically. Um, so this will just be some very gross approximations for you guys to follow and feel free to experiment. In fact, you have to experiment. You've got to try it on scrap pieces and see what it looks like because how else are you going to know? The last thing you want to do is apply this to a finished piece and then find out it's the wrong color. Okay, so what I'm going to do, because I want this to be fairly dilute, I'm going to take two parts of this light brown. Okay, clean off your measuring tool so you don't cross-contaminate, and just one part amber. I don't want a whole lot of amber color, just a little bit. Okay. Now, I need to dilute it pretty significantly. These two were tests that I did where I diluted it maybe five parts, uh, ten parts on the other one, um, and they're still too intense. There's just too much color there. So, I use my little spray bottle. You can see there's not really a whole lot in here. I'm just going to keep spraying until I dilute it out far enough. I give it a good mix. And then take a little bit and try it on the surface. Use this corner down here. Now these dyes typically go on pretty dark. The color looks good, but it might look a little bit too dark. But as it dries, you get a little less intense color. In fact, sometimes it just looks like crap until you get your finish applied on top of it. Okay, so now what I'm seeing here, these have a little bit too much intense color. This one looks just around the point that I want it to be. I don't know if that's going to come across in the camera the way I want it to, but it looks a lot closer to natural oil finishes, uh, to this oil-based varnish, than these other two did. So that's the mixture I want to go with. Now, before I apply the dye to a surface like this, a lot of times the raw wood is very thirsty. So if it's manageable on a small piece like this, it certainly is, I still like to take a spray bottle, even though I pre-raise the grain, and I'm actually going to pre-wet the wood so that the dye doesn't... It, so it's not as aggressive when it soaks in. There's already some water on the surface filling those pores. Now when the dye goes on, it'll actually go on a little bit more evenly because the wood's not quite as thirsty. Okay, so I'm going to spread this dye around. Now you can see the left is just water, and the right is my very dilute dye mixture. Okay, and you can see it's not a huge difference, but that may be just the amount of color that we need to make it look good under a water-based finish. Now I'm going to let this board dry for, I don't know, four to six hours in my climate. It's pretty dry and hot here, so shouldn't have any problem letting it dry, but it's water, so you'll know when it's dry. If you feel the surface and it's cold and clammy, a little bit damp, it's not ready yet. Okay, now you don't necessarily want to jump right to your water-based finish on top of this. And the reason why is this is a water-based dye. So you add water-based finish right on top of there, you could very well move that dye and start pushing it around with your finish because it sort of reactivates the dye. So once again, we're going to rely on shellac as a barrier coat 
that's going to seal that color in and allow us to put the water-based finish right on top. Okay, so we're going to seal in that color. Again, water-based dye. We're going to hit it with an alcohol-based finish here, which is shellac, and that's going to seal it in so that our water-based top coat doesn't pull any of that material with it. Now, even this alcohol-based material has potential to, uh, to pull some of that color. So if you can spray, that's really the best way to go because it'll uh, lay down a nice even coat. Uh, if you wipe, you're almost surely going to get some dye on there, but it probably won't affect the overall color when it's all said and done. Now, we talk about shellac a lot on the show, but typically I go the lazy way, what I find to be the easier way, and I use this bullseye seal coat. It's D-Wax Shellac. It's about a two-pound cut, and it's what they would refer to as blonde shellac. It doesn't really have a whole lot of color to it. And this is the stuff that I'm going to use between the coats of the other finishes that we're experimenting with to seal that color in. But in this case, we're going to do something a little different. We're actually going to mix our own from flakes. And this is really the best way. If you want the freshest shellac and you want color options and things like that, you basically mix what you need on the spot from these dry flakes, and um, it's really a great way to go about it. So let's take a closer look at that process. Now, if you're going to mix your own, there's a few things that I recommend getting. Obviously, the first is a good quality shellac. Okay, the stuff that I use here is from Hock. Okay, that's H-O-C-K. Um, if you are into hand planes, you're probably familiar with Hawk Tools. They make some of the best plane blades that you'll ever find. But they also have a site called HawkFinishes.com, and that's where they sell one of the best shellac flakes on the market. Um, they come in these little plastic bags, and it's a trademark sort of looking, you know, you, you'll see these on the shelves a lot at the stores, and you just can't miss them. They look exactly like this. Okay, what I've got here are two different varieties. Now, I mentioned that the seal coat is blonde which means it's not going to impart a whole lot of color. But I do want color, so this is where the, the key is. I have orange and garnet shellac, okay? One has a little bit more of a red tone to it, the other is just more orange. I think for this situation, I think orange is probably going to be the way to go. All right, so now when mixing your own shellac, what do you mix it with? It doesn't go into water, it doesn't go into mineral spirits. This is when we use our denatured alcohol. Okay, the alcohol will dissolve the shellac, put it into solution, and then make it so that it's either wipeable, brushable, or something that you can spray. All right? Now, if you're going to do this a lot, I highly recommend either stealing from the house or just go to Walmart and pick up a really cheap coffee grinder or spice grinder. And I keep this one in here expressly for this purpose. It's the only thing I ever use it for, and you can see the shellac dust that's left in there from pulverizing it. You see, when this stuff uh, dissolves in alcohol, the more surface area that's in contact with the alcohol, the faster it dissolves. Because if you just put these flakes in there, it's going to take a pretty significant amount of time, probably, I would say, maybe 8 to 10 hours, depending, um, for that to go completely into solution. And you do have to come back to it and shake it. So get yourself a collection of jars. We, uh, we eat a lot of pasta in this household, so we have plenty of spaghetti jars. Okay? And what we're going to do is make a two-pound cut, and that's the same thing that's in here. Now, for a better, much better explanation than I'm going to give you right now of um, shellac cuts and what that all means and exactly how it's all calculated, uh, I believe Charles Neal did a great primer on shellac and how great it is to use, and he kind of goes through the whole process there that I don't really um, have time to go into today, so I definitely recommend checking that out, and I'll put the link in the show notes for you. But a quick and dirty two-pound cut, all right? For me, I don't like measuring, I don't like weighing this stuff. Weighing it is the most accurate. Um, I like these sort of volumetric measurements because it's just easier for me to do. I take a jar, now I don't want to make a whole lot because I'm only doing a test board today, and I mark my fill line. Okay, and of course, this is an irregular shaped bottle, so that kind of screws me up a little bit. That's my final fill line. I don't want any more shellac than that when it's all said and done. Okay, then I mark a line that's going to be about halfway down. Now, I'm actually going to go a little lower than half because my bottle bows out at the bottom. And obviously, you could see how ballparked all of this is. Okay, and that's my halfway point. So the first thing I want to do... Now, if you put the shellac flakes in here without pulverizing them first, 
you want to bring it right up to that halfway line. And that's really a good ballpark measurement for a two pound cut. Since I am pulverizing this stuff, I'm actually going to get a lot more. Um, I'm actually going to get a lot more material. It's going to be more compressed. So if I fill it up to that same exact line, it's going to be quite a bit stronger. Uh, probably closer to what we would call a three pound cut. So I'm actually going to have mine fall a little bit under that line. Easiest thing to do, if you just have flakes, you basically put your flakes up to that halfway line. Okay, but I'm going to pulverize mine, which means I'm actually going to be able to fit more shellac material into a smaller amount of space, which would throw that figure off a little bit. So what I'm going to do is fill up my jar to the halfway line. Now once I'm at the halfway line, now I know I have about as much as I need, so now I'm going to pulverize it. Put it into the coffee grinder. Grind away. You don't have to go nuts on it. We're looking for a coarse grind, not necessarily an espresso grind. But what we've done now is drastically increased our surface area. Put that into the jar. Now you can see we're quite a bit below the line now. And that's exactly why we did it this way. Okay, so now we add denatured alcohol up to that fill line. Now, I know this stuff isn't good to breathe, but I, I know I can't be the only person in the world who loves the smell of denatured alcohol. And I just have enough. Look at that. Okay, so it's probably not a bad time to take a lunch break and bring this with you and just uh, every five or ten minutes or so, pick it up, give it a good shake, and then once you see that it's a completely clear, well not clear, but completely consistent solution, there's really nothing in suspension floating around, that's when it's ready to go. And you've got an approximate two pound cut and you didn't have to weigh anything. So after about three or four hours, shellac looks like it's pretty well dissolved. We can go ahead and pour it into a secondary container. Okay, now shellac, because of the alcohol in it, dries really fast. And if you have a problem applying it, there's nothing wrong with diluting it more. So just add more of the alcohol to the mixture and get it to the consistency that you have enough time to spread a nice thin layer. Now what happens is, the way you know you have a problem is as you start spreading it, you'll feel it catch, which means it's already starting to solidify uh, and it'll gum up on you, it'll get really messy. So if that happens, you may be better off just leaving it alone, letting it dry and sanding it back, or just grabbing some denatured alcohol and wipe it off. You can clean it all off that way. But the cure for it basically is to get some more alcohol and dilute it down a little bit to give you a little bit more working time. Okay, and so two pound is, you know, for this type of thing is, is about right. Might be a little bit strong. And if you're not used to shellac, you may want to bring it down to, uh, to a one pound cut roughly. And for this little sample piece, we shouldn't have much of a problem. That beautiful orange, amber kind of tone that's being imparted to the wood, it's exactly what we want. Perfect. All right, so here's all of our test boards. We've got the boiled linseed oil with a coat of shellac on top. I've got our dye mixture with a coat of shellac. And then we have uh, the orange shellac alone. And here is a raw board that we're just gonna put the water-based finish right on top. Okay, polyacrylic. Typical water-based material. This is a semi-gloss. I'm going to use one of these little foam applicators. And I think if you're, if you're not going to spray the water-based material, this is probably uh, the next best thing. You could certainly use a nice brush if you're good with brushing technique, which I am not. Okay, so boiled linseed oil, you're first. This applicator, nice, covers the whole thing in one shot. Apply to the dye. Here's 
Here's the orange shellac board. And our natural board. All right, so I'm going to let these dry for about three to four hours. I'll sand between coats with uh, 320 grit sandpaper. And I'm probably going to put on a total of about three coats. And that should do the trick. All right, so these results are really interesting. Um, here's our oil control board. And here's the water control board. Now, the interesting thing that I found, it may just be the varnish that I use, uh, but I don't see as much of a dramatic difference between my oil and water boards as you might think. Okay, the, the water is certainly a little paler uh, than the oil, uh, but it's not nearly as dramatic as some of these others. Now, I think I overdid it in some of these cases. For instance, like the dye. The dye was a little bit of an overshot um, compared to the oil. Okay, it's a, it's a completely different thing. Um, but certainly, we're, we're sort of skating in the same realm as far as it looking oil-like. What you'll notice with the dye, though, is that what we did was really pop the grain. Okay, that dye sits down into those uh, really absorbent stripes there and actually intensifies the grain pattern. And by popping that grain, sort of gives it that oil look to begin with. So uh, dye is definitely a viable option for sure, but clearly is going to take a little bit more work to, uh, to pinpoint and nail down that perfect combination of colors. Now here's an interesting comparison. Okay, this is the boiled linseed oil, and this is just a oil-based varnish. And it just goes to show you that boiled linseed oil really gives you uh, a lot of intense amber color imparted into the wood. This maple has just turned a very orangey, yellowish, uh, very, very light brown color. So you can certainly get there with that pre-coat of boiled linseed oil, uh, but you're going to have to be very careful of the adhesion issues and things that we discussed, but that, that shellac barrier should do the trick for you. But now that becomes a three-step process just to use water-based finish. So although it works, it may not be the best option. Now here's shellac. Okay, the orange shellac uh, that we got from, uh, from the Hawk Company uh, was fantastic. I think it turned out great and is probably the closest match to the oil from what I can see, from my perspective here. And then you're only talking a two-step process, a pre-coat of shellac and then your water-based coat. And you know what? Almost all of my projects get a wash coat of shellac on them, de-wax shellac, just because if there's any impurities on the surface or anything that uh, is not visible to the naked eye, it's a good idea to make sure you put that shellac on there. It's a light sanding sealer, essentially, and it's a great base coat for anything that you want to top coat with, whether it's lacquer, oil-based finish, or in this case, water-based. So shellac is getting a big thumbs up from me. And again, here's the water-based. So... Uh, I think what this says is that the water-based finishes in general are getting better and better and are looking more and more attractive. Um, I don't really think we have to worry about it as much as we might have in the past. Now keep in mind all this changes if you're using a dark wood. Okay, water-based finishes don't necessarily look great on dark woods because they have a little bit of a bluish hue and cast to them. So maybe we'll delve into that a little bit later. But for now, on lighter color woods, I think my recommendation, any of these will work. But I think what I would probably play with the most would be the dye and the shellac. Okay? And you can get the best of both worlds by combining these two. Maybe a pre-coat of dye, uh, cover that with some shellac to seal that dye in, hit it with a water-based finish, and um, you're going to have a tough time pointing out which one is the oil-based finish. This, uh, these finishes are getting really, really good. So experiment, have some fun with it. Um, these water-based finishes are a pleasure to use in terms of you know, just, just having it in the shop. It's just not nearly as offensive to your senses uh, as the oil-based stuff. Um, but I think it's a successful little experiment and can kind of show you the differences between the base coats and what you should use in your shop. So give it a shot. Let me know what your results are because, you know, this is just one experiment. There's a thousand variations of this that you can do. So uh, let me know what you wind up doing. All right. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll catch you next time.